All right, guys. So a lot of you know that I, I did kind of go into retirement, but I've reconsidered my position on that a little bit. And that's because, well, we are my reason for going into retirement had a lot to do with the new privacy policies and the fact that, that um, we seem to be losing a lot of our privacies. And the idea is that just by going online, I'm encouraging this. But, you know, I suddenly realized something, and that is I'm not really, I might not be in encouraging it, but I'm not doing anything against it by staying offline. So my philosophy now is if I'm going to be tracked, whatever time I have left for the First Amendment for freedom of speech, while we still have something akin to constitutional government, which by the way is fast fading into a corporatocracy, fast fading into a police state, whatever time we have left, I'm going to make use of it. So this is an open letter to the New York Times. Um, it's, I'm not going to write a letter to the editor because a letter to the editor is essentially, well, what is a letter to the editor? It's, you know, they can publish it, they cannot publish it. It's kind of like you're a rebellious, angry child writing back to the big authority up there in New York uh, with um, all kinds of, you know, some editor who spends his time at the Council on Foreign Relations and not interacting with ordinary people. Okay, it spends his time with with businessmen and, and establishment intellectuals. And won't respect some little guy out here who just has an opinion. Um, and that's not the way I roll. So I'm going to take this to the people's media. And it still is the people's media. I know that YouTube has instituted a lot of changes, but I have to give them credit. Google, I have to give Google some credit for informing people if state entities are spying on them. And supposedly that just means Syria or China. But... You know, there might be some pushback to some of our policies here, too. I don't think it, the policy necessarily just says foreign governments. I mean, it could be anybody. I, I could be wrong, but I, I like at least like the fact that Google, unlike Facebook, unlike some other entities, has, a, has forces that seem to be contending back and forth. They have forces that want to go along with the loss of privacy, but forces that are against it. Unlike some of these other agencies and some like other these some of these other quote unquote social networks out there. All right, this is a comment on the article from um, the New York Times op-ed, Wednesday, June 6, two thousand and twelve. It's on page A twenty three, entitled "Evolution Sweet Tooth" by Professor Daniel E. Lieberman. He's an evolutionary biologist at Harvard. And, you know, he's just a little bit proud of himself for being an evolutionary biologist at Harvard. I just think he has a, you know, a little bit, little bit uh, kind to himself, a little bit, and not so kind to others. But uh, that's my opinion. He wants to defend Herr Bloomberg's uh, autocratic rule of New York, particularly in the issue of big sodas, okay? And he states that measures like the ban on big sodas restore what was once natural. Now, we'll get into that, okay? Mayor Bloomberg has gone along, basically Mayor Bloomberg has bought himself a third term. He's established himself as a dictator. And he has gone along with every kind of national security justification for the loss of, uh, of civil rights, stop and frisk, the drones, the cameras, the um, uh, uh, all that Mayor Bloomberg has to say is the terrorists are coming to get you. And it seems like New Yorkers are just willing to to go along with it. Okay, I don't understand what's wrong with New York. I thought they were a bastion of, of free expression and freedom, and they were at one time. I don't know what's happened to them. All I know is that, that um, and this is an, there's going to be an irony in this, because it might be proof that we did not evolve as a species in big cities, and that big cities are therefore unnatural to us, which is a strange statement on my part, because I, what I, I'm using it to kind of put forth a certain political bent or a certain kind of narrative. That's exactly what Daniel Lieberman says also in support of his political narrative. He also agrees, and, he, and this is where I agree with, with this article, that we did not evolve in cities and that we evolved in a very different kind of environment and that we evolved as, as a tribal species and that as we evolved, that we were part of a social group and the social group enforced certain norms. And we both agree the one of those norms was, well, you don't just kind of consume all that you want. And you have to exercise because you're keeping up with the group. 
and that you know our our high sugar diets are not natural to us. We did not that that we did not evolve to have an abundance of junk. And I think that Professor Lieberman does make a good point. He makes and this is where it's ironic because he his his the his jumping off point is one where he and I would both agree. And that is that we're not, we're not adapted to being cut off from nature. We're not adapted to being cut off from our own past. Okay. And he also maybe makes a good point that, uh, quote, along these lines, we should ban all unhealthy food in schools, soda, pizza, French fries, and insist that schools provide adequate daily physical education, which many fail to do. There's a lot of good points in this article. Okay, and he makes a point that a certain degree of quote-unquote coercion is part of human society. I think even the anarchists are going to have to acknowledge that one at some point. We don't live in a never-never land. We don't live in utopia. Utopia means no place. I mean, I think the second law of thermodynamics would have some say in whether uh, their, the anarchist utopia is possible or not. No offense, I have a lot of anarchists who like this channel, so, you know, I can feel the tomatoes coming at me. But here's the situation, guys. This is where he goes very, very wrong. When we were in the uh, Paleolithic, before the Neolithic, before the Holocene, we did not have dictators controlling us. We were hunter-gatherers, for the most part. I think there might have been some variation in that. But the general rule of society was that the coercion was egalitarian in nature. The type of coercion that comes from one man who buys himself a third term and who is able to impose his fiat, even if it's a good idea, big sodas are bad, bad, bad. They are bad for you. I do not condone big sodas. And I'm not even sure necessarily that there should be the quote-unquote freedom to, for the marketplace to sell those. I mean, that, that's, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is if you really want to get back to the, uh, the, the hunter-gatherer period or, or, or some kind of ideal, ideal infancy of our species, and we can debate that concept, whether uh, that's a romanticization of the past, then we would at least have to be consistent and say that the idea of, an al of a kind of dictatorial alpha male controlling a huge territory like New York, is also unnatural to our species. Yes, big sodas are unnatural. Yes, uh, he, it may be that, an, quote, an evolutionary perspective helps explain why two-thirds of Americans are overweight or obese and what to do about it. And I, you know, to be honest with you, I, I have my struggles, okay? And I'm not disagreeing with them. Lessons from an evolutionary biology support the mayor's plan. When it comes to limiting sugar in our food, some kinds of coercion action are not only necessary, but consistent with how we used to live. Fair enough. But those that coercion came from your tribe. It came from your band. It did not come from one man imposing himself down. So you would also have to say that the kind of coercion that Mayor Bloomberg has been implementing over New York and the previous mayor before him that is also unnatural. If one is unnatural, and if that's going to be our standard, then the other is unnatural as well. And Professor Lieberman has to have the education to know that the kind of coercive state as it is is, is about maybe 10,000 years old, that it's a product of agriculture and not of the hunter-gatherers. Now, there are those who might question whether we can go back, period, or whether there is a, quote, human nature, or whether we are more defined by our environment than by some kind of idealized past. A lot of it, it's interesting, both Professor Lieberman on the one hand and the kind of anarchist critique of civilization from, uh, I don't know, the primitivists on the other hand, both rest on this idea of our evolutionary past and it becomes a political football. I think the primitivists have the better argument. But, you know, in both cases, they would critique things like huge gulp sodas, okay, which, by the way, I don't drink. They are bad, bad, bad. At the same time, though, if we do establish the precedent of banning something outright that is bad, 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 what else might we start banning that is bad, 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 more from the standpoint of control than of health? And that's the question I'm going to leave you with. Thank you.